Good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to the last day uh, of the Nordic Climate Action Weeks. And welcome uh, to our Nordic Pavilion uh, at the COP25 in Madrid. Uh, and welcome to our online viewers. My name is Stian Fjellal, and today we are so fortunate that we will have uh, Nordic climate ministers uh, in our panel in Madrid. Um, and with those, with those words, I will just uh, give the word to my colleague in Madrid, Andrea Jamholt. Thank you, Stian, and uh, hello, Stockholm. It's uh, very nice to have you with us today, as we have some really exciting guests with us this morning. As you all know, the negotiation is still going on here in Madrid, and we might not see the final result, maybe until tomorrow. Uh, and in the middle of a hard, nego hard negotiations, um, three Nordic environmental ministers have set aside time to be with us. That's Nordic transparency for you. And um, without further ado, I want to introduce the ministers. It's um, Krista Mikkelen from Finland. It's uh, Ola Elvestun from Norway. And it's Isabella Löfven from Sweden. And I'm going to start with uh, you, Krista, since it's the first time we have you on the stage with us here. And as Finland has the EU presidency as well, and the, you have been leading the EU delegation here at COP25. First question is, is Europe speaking with one voice in these negotiations? Yes, we have been speaking with one voice and, and that voice has been very strong that we need more ambition and we need more action and very quickly. So it's, it's very happy that yesterday night we got a clear message from the European Council that uh, the whole Europe is, is behind this 2050 uh, climate neutral target and committed to do it. And also this Green Deal, what Commission uh, published this week, is a, is a such right message that we need action and we need to start it now. Even though we have a target in 2050, we can't wait for that. We need to action today and tomorrow. And actually, we needed to start it already yesterday. And, and luckily, the European countries has been very active. But and now we need to recall all the other countries to follow us and to understand. If we look at the science, there is no doubt that we need to know more and and that's why especially the next year when there is a time to countries to uh, update their NDCs it's the most important that we have a real strong message that we need, need more ambitions and and we all the countries need to uh, update the NDCs to be in, in the line of the Paris Agreement and 1.5 degrees. Mm -hmm. Let's move on to, to Norway's uh, Minister for Climate and Environment, Ola Elvestuen. Um, you are also the president of the UN Environmental Assembly, the, the highest kind of decision-making uh, body related to the environment here. And you have, I know, been leading or chairing some of the negotiations until three o'clock this uh, tonight or last night. Last night. Yeah. Are you tired? Well, we should be tired, the <laughs> ministers have been tired uh, at this stage of the negotiations like this, so that's no problem. Uh, what are you, your feelings um, about the outcome of the negotiations uh, now on the final leg? Well, that will be decided today, or maybe also tomorrow, isn't it really how successful this COP will be? I think the major issue is what is mentioned. It is to have strong enough uh, language on ambition, because that is really what we, that is a, the main take of this one is to, to give a signal to the world that uh, during next year, uh, nations of the world will increase their ambitions to such a level that it's possible to see that we can uh, stay below two degrees and also aim for 1.5 degrees. You have a lot of countries that have said they will increase ambitions, but the larger emitters outside of, of the EU, mm -hmm. I think the EU's uh, message is, is really the strongest that uh, that we've had and, and has a global real impact. 
and then of course North Norway. We are so, we are so closely linked to the EU now. We have the same goals for us. We want 55, and are working for that. When it comes to the other issues on uh, uh, markets, there is still uh, work that has to be done. That the, that you get an agreement that has the quality that is high enough that there's no double counting, but we still can find a solution. Mm -hmm. And on what I've been facilitating, the loss and damage, which is a very difficult uh, area, that it goes how we can strengthen the work uh, to to uh, meet uh, the most dramatic uh, changes that we see by global warming, extreme weather events, etc. how to scale up the support, both to, to prepare for it, to build back be better when it happens, but here to find, we have put forward a text that we really think is the middle ground that we put forward uh, this uh, last night and, and think that, that that should hold through the last couple of days. But all the parties and the countries, they need to, to want to, to focus on what we need to achieve. Also in this area, we need to take one step and a large step further instead of just focusing on their uh, their uh, positions that they had coming into the meeting. Have there been any moves or, or yeah, well, moves? Yeah, of course, they, they the have been negotiating mm. all last week. Mm. So, so there is a text with a lot of mm. good language mm. in it. So, so what we are are looking at is the last uh, points where we have listened to all the parties. They do not. Uh, they do not agree through those. Uh, rounds that we have had, but we have listened and has focused on where we think the the balanced text can be, and has put that forward to the presidency, so they can do their work that is so important at the uh, now at the last stages. But I think what we have put forward is is taking into account all countries' inputs, but they everyone gains something. But then you also have to move away from some of the positions. Let's move on to Isabella Levin, uh, the Swedish environmental minister. Uh, a couple of days ago, uh, you told the world leaders in the plenary that we must listen to the demands of the young people. We must um, enhance our ambition and reduce our uh, emissions. Um, what kind of reaction have you got from the world leaders on that strong message? Well, um, I'm not the only one giving that message. So <laughs> I wasn't the first to kind of break the news that the, <laughs> the children are out there and they're demanding action. So everyone knows that. Uh, but there's a dissonance between what's said and expected from us from the global citizens mm -hmm. and the negoti negotiations in here. I think basically there's, kind of two major issues here. One is the ambition and that we need to live up to the Paris Agreement. We need to reduce emissions. And if we're gonna do that in a transparent way, in a way where we can trust each other all over the world, we need a rule book, we need an accounting system, we need a transparency on how the different countries are reporting that we can trust. So there's no double accounting, there's no kind of trying to, to, to cheat the system. So this is really the, the base for us to be able to know that we will reach the Paris goals. Then the other question is what Ula is now dealing with, that it's more like looking backwards on all the damage that has already been done by us, the rich countries, uh, and how are we going to uh, compensate for that through money to adaptation, support for capacity building, etc. And then, of course, loss and damage for permanent damages. And um, the, uh, I think the, import, the most important thing that we need to focus on is reducing emissions. But if we're going to get all the other countries along, then we have to recognize all the damage that has been done. And we also have to recognize that poorer countries are the ones that are affected the, the hardest. And we need to, to make sure there's resources and uh, we must all try all the time to build trust. But I think what uh, the European Union did uh, last night when we actually could produce an agreement that we should go for net zero emissions by mid-century 
that sends a really important message to the world that we mean business. We are really serious about this. So we're also giving a lot of um, financial support to developing countries, but we're not only kind of trying to buy uh, emissions credit by from poor countries, but we're going to do our own homework. And that sends a really strong message. I almost felt like giving you a hand for that. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, uh, I can ask a lot of questions here on the stage, but uh, I think there are so many here in the audience that has their own question. And Stian, I would, uh, I would like to start with, with Stockholm. Are there any questions there from Stockholm? A couple maybe, and then I, I would like to say as well that we have a huge crowd, a lot of young people here in Madrid. And I actually want to emphasize that I'm going to let the young people speak here. Okay, mm. Stockholm, go ahead. Uh, we, we don't have a huge crowd, but we have an informed crowd, I think, a smart crowd. Anyone uh, want to ask a question to the ministers from Stockholm? Maybe we can come back to us and, uh, and you can take over. In Stockholm. Okay, hands in the air, everybody. We have one, two behind there. State your name and then... Yeah. Question. My name is Naya. I'm coming from Changemaker Norway, and we're part of the civil society, and we've been following the nego negotiations very closely these whole two weeks. And I've been uh, focused on loss and damage. And our minister, Ola Alvestun, is also deeply into that also. And uh, Ola, you just uh, uh, told us that you've found a middle ground uh, and I've barely read the paper and I've seen some very good things in there. Uh, but as a civil society, we're not completely happy, of course. Um, we have to, you say that we, we have to not only think about the original positions that parties have come with, but find the middle ground. But I believe that we also have to remember that those original positions are based in a very unequal world, in an unequal power structure with rich and poor countries. And we can also see that here at COP. And when we've been inside the negotiation rooms, it's been a little different than I feel like you're trying to, or all of you in general are trying to say outwards. I've heard a passive EU. I've heard uh, a vague Norway when it comes to finance of loss and damage. Um, it's, it's very important for us that we reach the 100 billion goal in 2020 and it doesn't look like we're going to. Right now in the text they're talking about that we're going to be able to write scaling up finance. All of the civil society, G77 plus China, the developing countries, the island state countries, they all want to have new and additional finance in the text. Both Norway, the EU, the United States, Australia and other rich countries, they are afraid to give new and additional finance and that's exactly what we need to uh, to reach the 100 billion goals without cheating. Um, so I guess maybe my question is, do you feel like you are really trying to reach the 100 billion goals with vague language such, such as scaling up? Are you afraid to take your historic responsibility? We as a civil society are here to really watch you and go home and tell our countries what you you are doing here. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, I think that one's for you. <laughs> yeah, and, and to, there's no disagreement that this is a really a huge problem. And for some countries, I mean, the small island states, it is, is truly existential. There's no doubt about that. So this is not the, if there is more finance, we have to scale up, but it is how this is to be done that is the that is a disagreement. 
Uh, and of course, we have heard the positions of, of uh, new and additional, but that is not a, a position that will get an agreement on this COP. So we have to focus on scaling up. And if we look at the wordings of the text that we proposed, it is, it is, it is the wording is quite strong. And you take in every group, so it's a broad scaling up uh, that is uh, proposed uh, in there. And we also looked at um, some of them, uh, some of the with the expert group with the uh, with the Santiago network. This is very technical, so it's hard to follow. But those that follow negotiations, they understand what it means. So we've taken that in uh, and think this can be a position. And we also have to. Uh, so this is on on the worst causes of global warming where we have to go in at the same time we also of course have to fill up on on adaptation and also on the on the mitigation and i think one of the positive things also of this cop is the focus on nature based solutions that we had to lift just a year ago there's been such a change just in one year and and from from norway side to do that i'm also very glad that one of the major announcements this week is the agreement that we have um, Together with uh, Germany, the UK, and with Colombia, uh, the support we are for them to halve their deforestation rate by 2025. That is also a, a major. So there are things happening. Uh, yes, you have difficult negotiations, but we are not solving the the problem of go, global warming here in these COPs. That is what happens between the COPs. So we have to focus on what is moving. And then we have to have the framework in the Paris Agreement and manage to, we got to the, the rule book last year, and then manage to move it forward every year. So I think the most important also on loss and damage is to have a deal here so that we can take that major step uh, instead of holding on to the difference. Because there's so much positive in the text that we put forward that that is the, the, uh, the focus that we should have. I would also... Uh... What I heard was a vague EU. Krista, any comments on that? Well, when we're talking about the financing, the EU is the, is the one who has financed the most. And for us, we do understand that we do have this historical response as well. So we need to take uh, and make our, our part, that's for sure. And we do have now uh, these finance mechanisms like a Green Environmental Fund and, and uh, the other funds. And that's what we can use now. Because when we are talking about some new uh, finan financial tools, it takes time before we can use them. So it's important that we use those tools, what we have now, and make sure that all the EU countries are willing to finance more. And when they are, for example, um, uh, deciding about the uh, uh, funds for the development projects, they, they always look at that also in sense of the climate policy and uh, adaptation and mitigation in developing countries. I really think we're tapped into something here. Isabella, you also wanted to comment on that. Yes, I'd like to comment on, on the, the political complexity of talking about new financial mechanisms at this point. We already have the Green Climate Fund, we have the Adaptation Fund, we have the Least Developed Countries Fund, we have a bilateral uh, cooperation with development support, we have the World Bank, we have all the financial institutions that are saying that they are getting into adaptation and we have all need to, 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 to progress to a, a, a car decarbonized world and also help, of course, developing countries. But I think to kind of get bugged down right now here in Madrid and for Glasgow on new financial mechanisms on all the damage we've done in the past, would that give us the vision forward that we need in order to get away from fossil fuels? That, I mean, we're in this, I think this dynamic where we're starting uh, to, to uh, get away from the Paris spirit. The Paris spirit was, okay, so we're gonna get this done. And now we're back like who's to blame most and who's going to pay. But your question on the 100 billion, I think we're going to get there. Uh, and actually, it's a drip in the ocean because what we need for, to do the transition is not 100 billion. 
it's trillions and trillions and trillions. And what we need to do is to get all the financial flows to go to a sustainable development and agenda 2030 and, and getting away from fossil fuels. Okay, yeah. a small uh, comment on that, and then yeah. we have now, another now question thought, back there. I I the, the last words that were so good, because mm -hmm. I was talking about really the, the, the big things that we have to do. But on the deal that we're working on now, also look at the proposal that we have on, the, on broadening responsibility on the Green Climate Fund. That is also part of the proposal that they have put forward. Okay, next question back there. Yeah. Uh, hi. My name is Hilda, and I'm also from the Norwegian Civil Society in Norway. Um, and while I've been here, um, I've followed Article 6. And it's very important that we do Article 6 right. Because, firstly, um, it's difficult to change something that is established. And secondly, because it can have huge consequences for both the climate and human rights. Um, Article 6 is made so that it gets easier for countries to um, deliver higher ambitions. And in the Paris Agreement, in 6.4, it stands that countries uh, shall aim to de uh, deliver um, an overall mitigation in global emission. I have experienced that many countries try to negotiate themselves out of responsibilities and undermine the actual Paris Agreement by, um, by um, a promote an option where it stands that this should be voluntarily. And a an voluntarily option will not have the same um, impact as a uh, compulsory option. So I want to know how your countries work for an OMG. That's my question. You want to direct it to someone in particular? Anyone? I can start. Go ahead. I, I fully agree with you. And that's what uh, the EU wants. We, we don't need those kind of rules which are not good enough. If we can't, if, if we can't have the Article 6 good enough here, it's better to continue the discussions next year. We need to make sure that there's no double counting. We need to make sure that we have that kind of rules that it makes sure that we are cutting down the emissions. And, and we need to make sure that there's an integrity, natural, uh, integrity of, for nature and also for the, for the human rights. So those are the, the no goals for us that we, we don't want to have a bad rules. There's better to not have rules here if we are ending up to having the bad news, bad, bad rules. So that, that's very important to EU and, and the Article 6 is, is still whole open. So let's see that, that how it's going on and, and are we getting to, to good rules because that's what we need, good rules. Yeah. I agree. Yeah, I think Norway is very much aligned with the EU uh, on, the, on the Article 6. So it's, it's really about getting a a, uh, an agreement that has the necessary quality, because it, it has necessary quality, no double content, it's a discussion of quotas that can be brought over to pre-2020 over, and how large that cannot be too, too large, because then it, it weakens. It has to strengthen the Paris Agreement so that you can get uh, more ambition and not being a, a result that in the long run will weaken the Paris Agreement. And you also have the discussion if there's there's part of this that uh, will go over to adaptation that is part of this also, that, uh, that we are positive in and looking at and I'm positive on that. I just want to go back to Stockholm to, to check if uh, there are any questions from Stockholm while we have been I will have a look at my here. audience and uh, they are just looking back at me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's one question actually here. Yes, uh, stick please your name go ahead. First. Sure. Hi, my name is Nikolai. I work for the Danish uh, Ministry of uh, Climate and Energy. I have one quick question for you. You have plenty of green voters, the entire Nordic, uh, but it seems that we lack green citizens. Everyone wants change, but no one wants to do things differently. Everyone wants renewable energy. No one wants transmission lines in their backyard. Everyone wants us to do something about aviation and emissions, and we're leading the green energy transition, but yet again, we are not leading in terms of CO2 per capita. So how do you translate 
your green voters into green citizens. That's it. Thank you. Well, <laughs> Isabella, do you want to answer that? Um, I think every major change in society needs those that are pioneers and, and really takes leadership and, and shows a bit of, of, of courage. And of course, in Sweden, we've had a lot of resistance against many of the reforms we've done under, uh, over the last uh, four and five years. For instance, the introduction of a tax on aviation kind of unleashed uh, complete uh, uh, rebellion in the Swedish parliament. And they tried also to actually um, have votes of uh, distrust of, of different ministers, etc. But now we find that uh, the tax on aviation is actually quite a, quite a very accepted and very popular uh, tax. People find it really reasonable that also the aviation should pay. Uh, so uh, you, you need, I mean, but if we only would have least listened to the majority in the parliament, then uh, we would not have come forward with that. But now people think it's okay. And actually the, the, the numbers of passengers in Sweden have decreased now for two years mm -hmm. in a row, actually 11% uh, reduction for domestic flights and five, I think, for, for foreign flights. And uh, little by little, you can see that, okay, so this is not a big sacrifice and we're going to also invest in high speed railways and they're gonna be alternatives. So we just need to carry on because it's the right thing to do. And uh, by the way, we got uh, good numbers of reductions of emissions in Sweden <laughs> yesterday. So I'm quite happy that it seems like the trend is now uh, that we are starting to reduce emissions. Yeah. Since that was, was kind of a question leading back to, to the Nordic countries homewards, uh, just some months ago, the Nordic prime ministers um, decided on uh, an agreement that uh, within the Nordic cooperation that states that the Nordic uh, region should take the lead in this green transition. We want to be the front runners. Um, how can we improve that um, cooperation to, to get there? Some concrete suggestions? Well, we have, of course, we, we are in a, in a cooperation. Here we are members of the <laughs> EU. We are as closely aligned to the EU as that is possible when it comes to the climate issues and are, are now setting out the same goals. So this is the set, uh, same goals for 55% there. But then I think it's, we all are countries that are ahead in, in maybe different areas. Uh, but we need to learn from each other and mm -hmm. co cooperate on that. And I think, at least from my thing, I think there's three things that always work. One is to cut emissions, and we have to do it as fast as we can. 40, 50% by 2030, uh, we have to, or 55% by 2030, uh, or, and also to 2050. And we need more nature, but really also to the question of, of uh, where do we get the, the citizens? The, go the, the What is really challenging is, is that we need to to establish a global market economy within the boundaries of nature. And that is the only economically sensible thing to do because everything else doesn't make sense. And for that, we need a broad cooperation also in the Nordic countries to think where are we to be in 2030, 2050, and look what kind of Nordic, Nordic area we need uh, and want for that with the high speed rates, uh, rail yeah, lines and yeah, everything. Yeah. Yes, you can do and, that. And, okay. and actually, uh, I mean, we are the 12th biggest economy in the world put together, the Nordic countries. And now we see Denmark, Finland, Norway, you're also, you're, you're in there uh, on, the, on the targets. And uh, this is really pushing the EU as well and, and, and getting a sense that uh, this is possible and we can do it preserving our, our welfare states and our good economies. Okay, I know you guys are on a schedule here, but I think we have time for just one short question. Was it? No. Then we... Ah, back there. It has to be very, very short. Okay, the short question is like following. During these discussions, you had three countries uh, that was slowing down the process for the New Deal because of that coal-fired dependence. We have all the technology with wind power, thermal energy storage to replace hot water and steam, etc. Are you arranging PPP for all the finance available in Europe to solve this issue? Or do you believe it will again be one road, one belt from China solving the issues for these countries and the investments in getting rid of the coal fire in these three countries? 
Swedish minister, please. And then we have to round it up. Well, I'm, I'm not sure I got the question right, but we are uh, we have set the targets of 100% renewable energy by 2040. We're going to pursue that. Uh, and we are also seeing an enormous expansion of wind power and renewable energy in Sweden uh, the last few years, ever since we set that goal. And that proves that, you know, uh, industry is there, uh, technology is there, innovation will be there once you set the political targets. That will unleash enormous investments, and we're seeing that happening right now in Sweden. Thank you for a short answer. Okay. And thank you, Krista Mikkonen, Ola Elvestun, or, uh, and uh, Isabella Levin for being with us here today. I know you guys uh, have to rush off. So thank you again, and thank you to the audience here in Madrid. Stockholm, over to you. And thank you to the audience and to you in uh, Madrid. Uh, I will just remind people that uh, we have uh, d our daily briefing, the last daily briefing today at uh, 2 o'clock, uh, also online. Um, uh, and our guy is Henrik Hallgrim Eriksen, head of delegation uh, Norway. Uh, and I will also remind you of our hashtag, Nordic Climate Action, if you want to post something in uh, social media. Uh, and thank you for now.